Thanks, everyone, um, and welcome. Most of these people I know very well since my family is here, and uh, um, but it is great to see both the folks in the room and the folks on Zoom. So um, thank you for coming. So we have um, um, a very sort of casual night in front of us, but I thought to begin with, I wanted to sort of think about um, with you all the sort of idea of travel books or adventure travel books sort of broadly construed. That's what this book is. Um, ultimately, it's sort of a, a collection of connected stories about the times that I've spent outdoors, um, mostly with students um, in all kinds of different places. And it certainly falls, um, roughly speaking, within the genre of travel adventure literature, um, you know, stories about going to places that are maybe a little bit remote or difficult to get to and what happens when you're out there. And so um, there's a long history to those sorts of stories that I think um, really helps us kind of, kind of understand sort of where the genre is now. It's very different now, I think, than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. Um, uh, even the sort of earliest stories that we sort of relate back to within uh, the history of sort of historical and or travel writing were, in essence, kind of adventure travel, like Herodotus, basically a travel writer, right? He was traveling around 400 BC and telling these stories. Um, um, Batua, who was a, uh, an uh, Arabian traveler in like the 1300s, he was a travel writer. And so we kind of move through this uh, sort of long story of going to places that are unfamiliar and having experiences that are kind of wild, right? Um, but within the sort of colonial era, as we sort of move closer to our own time, that kind of takes on a resonance of um, very much sort of more technologically advanced people going to places that were less technologically advanced in a very sort of colonial way and reporting back and kind of exoticizing those places. And that starts to include much more modern authors like your John Muir is um, sort of talking about the Sierra in this way that it's this um, sort of pristine, unpeopled place. Um, even Melville, who wrote Moby Dick, was actually, um, prior to that, he was, he was a travel writer. He wrote a book called Taiki, which is about his adventures in the South Pacific. So you kind of get this sort of uh, sense that it's all sort of white males telling the story of what's going on in these other places. And that really was sort of adventure travel literature for a long time. But thankfully, that's really changing right now. And there's incredible writers out there. Um, Ginny Reddy jumps to my head right away, who recently wrote an incredible book called Wanderland, where um, she's Indian and she talks about her experiences in Britain, um, sort of exploring someplace local as an outsider. Um, and it becomes this really sort of interesting sort of flip-flop of the idea of the sort of colonial um, travel narrative. So um, travel and adventure travel books have changed over the course of time, and they're really sort of coming into, I think, a new era. Where we have much more interesting stories, diverse people um, from different um, viewpoints, which is great. But the problem is, is that I kind of am more in, in line in terms of who I am with those old guys, right, with the old colonial writers. But um, I still had all these adventures and stories that I wanted to share. So what do I do? Um, do I sit down and tell those stories and sort of ignore the fact that there's this kind of history of, you know, sort of colonial aspects to adventure travel literature? Do I just sort of forget about that stuff and write these stories? Um, so, you know, as I sat down to work on this book, I probably should have brought a tent. I had to think about that. And it was a, it was a difficult question because I also wanted to write a book that's funny. Um, I wanted to tell these stories because ultimately when you're outdoors, that's when funny stuff happens. That's where the adventurous um, sorts of experiences transpire because it's so unpredictable out there. It's so unknown. Anything could happen. Um, and so I had to figure out a way to do that, to tell the stories that I wanted to tell and at the same time do justice to that sort of long history of sort of the colonial aspects of travel literature. So how to do that was, was um, a real juggling act that I had to figure out. I don't know if I did it well or not. We'll find out. We'll see. Um, but, um, but that's what I tried to do because I certainly didn't want to like pretend that history didn't exist. I didn't want to pretend that the contemporary world and some of the challenges that are facing um, the people who live in these areas still exist. So I had to write it in a way that was honest and tried to be truthful about that. So that's what I did. Um, so that's kind of where this book sits roughly within sort of the adventure travel, travel literature sort of world. Um, but this book specifically is, is sort of interesting because I, um, um, I think everybody has books that when they look back are like the few books that really, if you're a reader, um, especially if you're a writer, but certainly if you're a reader, that really sort of set you on whatever course you ended up on um, in the world of like imagination and writing. 
folks. And I know for me, there's a couple. Um, Gene Craighead's George's My Side of the Mountain is a book that I've been um, very methodically um, sort of ripping off for like 30 years now. Um, um, Call of the Wild by Jack London is another book that like really stood out to me. And I really wanted to kind of capture that excitement, capture that style of adventure. And so those books kind of carry with us. And I loved those books as a kid. Like I, I've read Call of the Wild, who knows how many times, like 30, 40, 50, who knows? Um, and I loved it. And so I knew from um, a really early age, I was like, I want to write stories like this, like kind of these adventurous stories. I want to write these stories where people are, you know, in these extreme situations and, and, um, and having these incredible adventures. Um, but I didn't do that right away. I instead sort of uh, rambled around and, and worked with kids mostly as a teacher, as whatever. But I, I always ended up um, gravitating towards outdoor teaching, outdoor education, wilderness instruction, that sort of thing, and did that for years and years and years and years. Um, and when I finally was sort of older and I thought, now's the time to write, um, I didn't really know how to tell those stories quite yet. I wasn't sure. Um, and then I wrote, uh, you know, the editors weren't calling and the agents weren't calling because I had written nothing. I was just kind of sitting around waiting for all that to happen. But then one day I wrote a little essay on um, curiosity, what it actually is, and sent it off to an online publication and it actually got published. And then through that, um, started working with editors and started writing books and started figuring out, wait, there's, there are these stories, but they weren't the stories I really wanted to tell. I still wanted to tell stories like Julia of the Wolves. I still wanted to tell like stories about adventure and travel. Um, so it took a while, it took a couple of books, but I got there finally. Um, when the pandemic hit, I sat down and I, uh, and I put this all together. So these are, um, these are all true stories. These all actually happened. Um, and I thought I would share some with you all tonight. Um, so a little bit of context, um, briefly, um, this story really sort of traces all the kinds of adventures that I've been lucky enough to have. Um, but it really starts with, uh, working for Outward Bound, which is, um, um, an organization that takes kids on wilderness trips. And um, I joined as an instructor at Howard Bowen when I was only 19 years old. I'm barely older, I mean, literally, just a few years older than the students themselves. Um, why they gave me that job, I'm still wondering. But um, they did, and so I was working with students outside. And so this first selection I thought I'd read um, is about sort of the beginning of that, the beginning of becoming an instructor, the beginning of that sort of experience. So um, this chapter is called Rifa, which will become clear why it's called that in just a second. So this is Rifa from, I probably should have brought a tent. <clears throat> the night hummed and crackled around me with life. Chirps, buzzes, squawks, moths dive bombed my headlamp. I felt an insect chomp my ankle, then another behind my knee. In Vermont, mosquitoes and black flies can be a nuisance but what I quickly realized is the mosquitoes biting me in Florida were in a different league. It was like someone was dancing around me under Harry Potter's invisibility cloak with a cattle prod, zinging me with abandon. Each bite brought a sharp, stabbing, wasp sting pain. I slapped and swore, stamping my feet. Panicking, somehow I got the tent up into a rough facsimile of shelter and dove in through the door, pushing my sleeping bag in front of me and hysterically zipping the screen shut. But somehow, all the mosquitoes had gotten in the tent with me. They continued to bite everywhere now. I felt their needle-like proboscises stabbing my ribs, back, arms, even my face. Trying to muffle my screams, I wriggled into my sleeping bag despite the oppressive armpit-like heat and humidity of the Florida outback. The stings kept coming. Popping my head out of the stifling bag, I used my headlamp to examine my body. And that's when I saw them. I was covered in fire ants. I had unknowingly pitched my tent on an anthill populated by Solenopsis invicta burin, commonly known as the red imported fire ant, or Rifa. The next period of time exists in my memory as a shattered frenetic series of jump cuts. Me twisting wildly about as I pinched ants off my body, their mandibles visibly jabbing my skin, a frenzied tent-bound discotheque strip tees as my headlamp strobes wildly and I twist and writhe, ripping off clothing, half-muffled screams and curses that sound as if I'm speaking in tongues. I spent the night hunting down ants in my tent, crushing their little exoskeletons while my body buzzed with painful bites. I was too embarrassed to sprint back to, sprint back to the bunkhouse 
and admit my stupidity, yet sweatily desired nothing more than to escape the sheer hellishness of a tent infested with fire ants. Caught between a self-imposed Scylla and Charybdis of idiocy, I barely slept as the occasional well-hidden ant wriggled out of hiding and made its location known with yet another savage bite. I was in Scottsmore, Florida, a godforsaken place to begin with, fire ants notwithstanding, to train as a wilderness instructor with Outward Bound, training I clearly needed as I aptly demonstrated that first night. The landscape around Scottsmore doesn't look like stereotypical Florida. No glitzy schmaltz of the beach cities farther south, no soul-sucking tourist lures of Epcot and Disney, but it's still Florida, so it's flat and hot. Gridded by dusty roads, Vidalia onion fields alternate with orange groves. Earlier in the evening, at the tender age of 19, I landed at the Orlando airport to begin my training as an outward bound instructor. I was nervous and unsure of what to expect. I had lived practically my whole life in rural Vermont and it showed. I was untraveled, unworldly and clueless. I'd never eaten sushi and believed 1980s movies to be the zenith of civilization. <laughs> I wandered aimlessly among the massive gleaming terminals, looking for the lead trainers who were supposed to pick me up. It was late in the evening, and the hordes of tourists had already passed through on their way to the happiest place on earth. The only thing that would have completed the image of the yokel out of his depths would have been if I was barefoot with straw clamped between my teeth, a burlap sack flung over my shoulder. A man ran towards me. A shock of curly terrier hair haloed his high forehead, a giant grin showcasing his diastema. It's a good omen. A gap-toothed smile was indicative of puckish intelligence and mischievous goodwill. See Eddie Murphy, Madonna, Woody Harrelson, Samuel Jackson. You must be Eric, he said, panting. Finally found you. I'm Pete. Pete was one of the other trainees. I later learned that he'd been in the army. He'd also worked in Antarctica, driving a forklift and doing odd jobs for rescue works. He had the personality of a poodle, all bounce and goofy exuberance. Pete was just past 30, but we bonded despite more than a decade separating us. We both, by circuitous routes involving shared peripatetic employment habits, had signed up to be trained as outward bound instructors and had arrived in Florida for a few weeks of orientation. Outward bound was started in England in 1941 by educator Kurt Hahn, a German Jew who spoke out against Hitler during the 1930s, got imprisoned, then fled to England where he zealously threw himself into education and created a number of different schools. The inception of Outward Bound, an organization taking students on rigorous outdoor adventures with the aim of building confidence and teamwork skills, resulted from Han noticing that older sailors fared better than young whippersnappers when faced with dire survival circumstances. Han saw the need for a school that taught outdoor skills, but also attempted to engender the kind of patient resilience he saw as essential to coping with extreme outdoor challenges. To serve, to strive, and not to yield became the Outward Bound motto. Now, outdoor programs and wilderness schools have proliferated across the world with giants like the National Outdoor Leadership School sharing a piece of the Outward Bound pie. But Han created one of the first of its kind. If various historical records are to be taken at face value, Han was a complicated individual. His accomplishments were numerous, but contrasted sharply with other personality attributes, including a propensity for discipline involving a stout cane and an overbearing personality. You can take the man out of Germany, but you can't take the Germany out of the man, I guess. Instructor orientation was a few weeks long, during which we learned to paddle canoes on the rivers and lakes of Florida in preparation to become our town instructors in its user risk program. Incarcerated kids would join us for 30 day river trips once we were all trained up. I helped Pete gather up a few other straggling trainees and we all jumped in a van driven by John, one of the lead instructors, and headed to base camp at Scottsmore. It was dark by the time we got to camp. There were maybe a dozen other trainees, all in their 20s. I was the youngest, Pete the oldest. The Scottsmore base camp was just a simple double-wide ranch house with a bunkhouse behind it, surrounded by palm meadows and scrubby copses giving way to agricultural fields. Like most teenagers, I was susceptible to a soul-crushing amount of insecurity for which I overcompensated with false bravado and embarrassingly obvious posturing. I keenly felt my age and lack of experience after spending a few minutes with the other trainees, most had graduated college, and noted a deficit in both outdoor and more elementary life skills, 
No bank account, stumped by the logic of filing taxes, understood female anatomy about as clearly as quantum theory. Thus, I was eager to overcompensate and prove that I was a capable outdoors person, ready to face whatever challenges the outback of Florida could offer. It was late, and as bunks were chosen, I volunteered to pitch a tent out in the yard. John and Heather, the instructors who'd be training us, looked puzzled, but shrugged. I grabbed one of the tents we'd be using during the course and blundered out into the yard. It was dark. I had a cheap headlamp that I strapped on and began trying to assemble the tent. After a few frustrated attempts, I finally began to make headway, threading recalcitrant aluminum poles through little nylon sleeves. It was at that point I began to make the acquaintance of the Rifa ants and endured a long, sleepless, miserable night. As soon as the sun streaked the sky, I left the tent, taking care to step over the now obvious ant hill right on my doorstep, covered in my sneaker prints. <laughs> I quietly made my way to the bathroom and stared in horror at my shirtless reflection in the mirror. It looked like I'd been slammed by atomic force puberty. Fire ant bites turned into little pus-filled whiteheads. I was covered in what looked like zits. Hideously disfigured, I waited in a shame spiral until I heard others waking and shuffling over to the kitchen. Mortified, I made my appearance. I was teased and given some advice. Don't pop the stings, it risks infection. Avoid anthills. Duh. <laughs> As I awkwardly stood with everyone else drinking bad coffee, the stories began. My own humiliation had acted as a prompt, and stories of stings, bites, and poor decisions began to flow. I gradually began to feel a bit less like an idiot. As Kyle, a bearded Georgian, related a story about a wasp nest in an old car, I murmured to Pete that it was nice to hear others had made mistakes like mine. I don't know, he said. Yours was pretty dumb. <laughs> so that's just one piece of Rifa. Um, that's all true, obviously. And um, uh, I'm just going to read a second sort of short selection. So when I worked with Outward Bound, um, Outward Bound, I think, is an interesting place in that why would you want to live most of your life outdoors for uh, a very small pittance of pay um, and really very little sort of job security or sort of net, like who, what kinds of people would possibly choose that as a lifestyle? Well, me, but so the people you meet are always very interesting and the people that become your instructors um, and the people that you work with when you become an instructor are oftentimes have these kind of really interesting backstories. And for a while, um, Outward Bound had a really great program where they had kind of an exchange program. So I worked with instructors from Kenya, for instance, and various other places. And at one point um, um, I got to work with a, um, a Swedish instructor um, named Lars. Um, and I'm going to try to do a Swedish accent for part of this, which I don't know how to do. So I want to apologize to any Swedish people who are either watching on Zoom or in the room. Um, I am also Swedish. Um, so I feel like I can do the accent poorly and it's all going to be okay. So I just want to throw that out there before I, before I launch into this. And yeah, I don't know uh, how, how to do a Swedish accent, but here we go. So that was my introduction to Howard Bound, and then here I am, sort of now that I'm, I'm working for them and hanging out with the other instructors. Someone was hammering on my door in the steamy pre-dawn. I lurched to wakefulness, heart thumping. Groping my way to the door in darkness, I yanked it open. There stood Lars in a tiny pair of running shorts, hair neatly tied back in a braid. Yeah, we are running now. That was the speech accent. <laughs> My cabin at the Yuli base camp was approximately the size of a SpongeBob suitcase a child would take for the weekend to Disneyland. The close confines meant that a healthy fart could suffocate in mere seconds, a scenario I tested nightly after consuming what passed for dinner at base camp. I mumbled some sort of acknowledgement and began hunting around for my shorts and socks. The not quite morning air hummed with insect life. The sky had the slightest of glows to the east, either the rising sun or the Stucky's truck stop a mile or so away. The sun was still below the horizon, not that I could see the horizon through the dense scrub forest around us. Lars resembled a pint-sized Arnold Schwarzenegger in physique and bearing. He had harsh, Teutonic good looks. You could imagine him beating someone up for information in a Stasi interrogation room with a smile. He was Scandinavian, Swedish, I believe, and how he ended up working with us among teenage felons in Florida I never knew or have long since forgotten. 
he took off like a deer. Lars didn't run so much as prance up on the balls of his feet. There was a gliding buoyancy to his stride, as though gravity had less of a claim on him than the rest of us. The perfect inverted triangle of his trapezius muscles led me into the thick undergrowth down a narrow trail. How does someone even get muscles on their back like that? <laughs> People experience their first moments of wakefulness differently. My wife, for example, is on a very different wavelength than I am upon rising from the waters of sleep. As we begin to shift and stretch, eyes barely open in the early morning, she'll turn to me. And it's like walking into an auctioneer's pitch midstream. Finn has violin state, but we also need to pick up the prescription before swimming. I'm really worried that if we don't transfer the money enough savings over to checking the account, it's going to be at zero if that appliance guy doesn't call back. I swear to God, can you call the school and make sure they know that Finn won't be there Friday? When's the last time you even called your dad? <laughs> My own internal monologue is more along the lines of, uh, coffee. <laughs> it appeared Lars woke with all cylinders firing. I tried to keep up as best I could. I am not the fastest guy out there. I don't have spring-like tension in my tendons and muscles. I'm built rather loosely, like an Ikea desk after it's been around for a few years and moved three times. <laughs> Screws are stripped, press board is flaking, one side is propped up with a wad of paper because it's uneven. Wobbly, but functional. I could practically hear the vitality surging through Lars's veins. He zipped down the trail, the distance between us growing by the second. Immediately, I began to fabricate excuses for why I was slow, should he stop to wait for me. Twisted ankle, recovering from a shark bite, just donated a kidney, hypoglycemic. Through the greasy sheen of sweat already stinging my eyes, I saw Lars bob low like a boxer, then spring back to the center of the trail without breaking his gazelle-like stride. I had only a moment to wonder why he performed this little maneuver before it happened. I ran straight into the massive web of a spider. Strands pasted themselves across my face. I felt filaments of silk bind my arms and legs, surprisingly springy and resilient. I frantically brushed a hand across my face and chest. And as I did, my hand hit what felt like a crab clinging to my shirt. Golden orb weavers, which Florida has given, Floridians have given the innocuous and misleadingly cute nickname of banana spider, can be huge with a leg span the size of a child's hand. I don't know if the one I ran into was that big, because I was busy having a nervous breakdown and vividly remembering the scene from Alien where the extraterrestrial latches onto John Hurt's face and lays eggs down his throat. <laughs> I let loose a little scream, okay, probably a large soul-rending shriek, and began to wildly swat the web and spider as I careened down the narrow trail hacked through the Florida outback. Lars didn't slow his pace. He called back cheerfully over his shoulder. Yeah, those spiders are everywhere. Lars kept running, and I tried to keep up, but his little Scandinavian form receded in the distance. I couldn't keep pace. My ambitions for physical exercise have always outstripped my follow-through. <laughs> During most of my life, I've been one of those people who go out for the evening, drink beers, gorge on pizza and fries, stumble home, eat bowls of cereal while mainlining Game of Thrones before falling into bed. I'd wake up bloated and bilious, head thudding the next morning, eyes red. I'd stumble to the bathroom and catch a glimpse of myself in the sink mirror swollen, sagging flesh, skin the greasy sheen of a sausage that's just gone off. <laughs> no more, I'd resolutely say to my reflection, from here on out, a new leaf. I'd throw on some running shorts and a t-shirt and go for a shambling, dry heaving run over spectacular dis distances like some medieval penitent fixed on absolution. I'd do burpees and lift weights and run hill sprints, my red stop sign face looking like the business end of a baboon. Joints loose, head clanging, a new life starts now, I tell myself. After my masochistic workout, I'd go through my day overly pleased at the soul cleansing I'd provided for myself. I'd return from the self-flagellating depths of hell, persevere through the gassy repercussions of a night out in Sodom and Gomorrah. Triumphant, I'd celebrate with a beer and start all over again. <laughs> I potted the webs coating my face and danced away, cringing and cutting the early morning air with colorful phrases. Lars had disappeared, outdistancing me in minutes. I shuffled along, filled with revulsion and shame. Nothing could make the morning any worse, I believed. Finally, after getting lost on the winding trails surrounding base camp, I found my way back. Looking forward to coffee and breakfast and a shower, I walked toward the main part of camp where the large outdoor showers were located. Enclosed within a scrappy wooden fence, we had a few rusty shower heads that sporadically sprinkled out room temperature water. 
I opened the gate and stumbled in. Yeah, you finally made it! <laughs> Lars was already well studded and brimming with hygienic enthusiasm. His nakedness was aesthetically perfect. The pube to genital ratio was, I believe, mathematically congruent to the golden mean. His body was flawless, like it was designed in a cryogenic lab. I grunted back at him and peeled off my running clothes. By contrast, my naked body looked like a boiled chicken, all knobby limbs and angles. My butt looked like 14 pounds of cold mashed potatoes. I ducked under the sprinkle of the shower head farthest from Lars, who was now vigorously scrubbing his body with a loofah sponge. I hadn't even brought soap, and so just stood there trying not to look at Lars, who was now singing Bon Jovi in his thick accent. Yeah, you're halfway there. Yeah, living on a prayer. <laughs> I wondered briefly what the homicide laws were in that part of Florida. <laughs> After our shower, we headed into the communal kitchen for breakfast. Lars was very methodical about breakfast, making sure he had equal parts protein, fiber, fruit, and vitamins. He always brought like toothpaste tubes filled with salmon and herring paste and would smear it on toast, which I felt broke some inviolable culinary law prohibiting fish at breakfast and should be prosecuted to the fullest extent. As the other instructors began arriving, Lars greeted each with a hail and hearty welcome and began regaling the room with scenes from our morning run. Yeah, and you should have heard him scream, he yodeled to the amusement of everyone there. I smiled weakly, stuffing my face with coffee and toast, wishing I'd gotten a job in some mail room where I could sort envelopes in a dark basement and be left mercifully alone. <laughs> we headed out into the early morning Florida sunshine. Lars came bounding up behind me, clapping me on the shoulder. We run again tomorrow, yeah, Eric? Sure. I mumbled, smiling weakly. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you. Thank you. So that's just a, a little selection of um, uh, some of the bits from the book. Um, it's been uh, such uh, a great feeling of um, satisfaction to take all these moments that I've, I've told these stories so many times um, to friends and family and to actually put them in to a book has been really gratifying. And one of the things that I think um, I found more than anything as I've sort of written the book and now, as um, you all know, it's a, it's a long process. You spend years sort of putting things together. You spend years working with editors um, is how much the outdoors in general has been important for me and for my family as, as a way that we sort of, a place where we sort of all come together, um, have these shared experiences. That's really sort of at the root of, um, um, of why it's so important to me and why I think um, people can connect with that experience because um, we've all been miles away from a flush toilet when we needed one. And so we all know what that experience is like, whether we want to know about it or not is another story, but um, we certainly all know what it's like. So um, um, I wanna make sure that um, there's time for questions. If there's folks on Zoom or if there's folks in the room that have questions, I'm happy to answer them. We can just, we can just you know, chat, we can talk about whatever, we can, um, can go outside and start a fire somewhere. I don't care, I'm up for whatever you all are up for, um, but I want to make sure that um, folks have a chance to sort of chat if they have thoughts, observations, questions, anything. Anybody have anything out there? And it's okay if you don't. Go ahead. I was curious whether or not you, um, while you're having all of these experiences, whether you keep notebooks with ideas or do you more formally journal or you just hope that you remember it? Uh, it's a great question. Sort of a combination of all of them. I'm a, a pretty... Um, obsessive but messy note taker. I take, I take notes a lot as my wife who's here will tell you. I write on like envelopes in the corners of magazines. I'm always sort of keeping stuff down. So whether or not I can locate them once I've written them is one, one thing. Um, but I do have stuff that stretches back decades that I've just sort of written down. Um, so, uh, and then sometimes I do keep sort of more formal notes or journals or stuff like that, but it's really all over the place. I wish I was more disciplined. I wish I had a really good answer. Like I wake up every morning and write for an hour and just, I don't, it's like, it's whatever happens to be nearby at the time, but um, but it works, you know. So that's what I do. Can, can you tell us the story about behind the the title? Because I love the title. <laughs> so it's actually in the book, um, and um, it is so. Uh, my, my I was lucky enough to sort of move around a bit as as an outdoor educator, and um, while I started in Florida, I did a lot of my. Um, uh, wilderness education out in California. And one of the trips that I took a number of times, which I love, was to Telescope Peak, which is 
um, a relatively high peak just outside of Death Valley. Um, so you really get this sense of, you know, Death Valley is obviously very low, below sea level. And then you climb, I think it's 11,000 feet or something like that. So that difference is they say it's sort of similar to the Tibetan plateau to Everest. I mean, it's really, even though 11,000 feet is super, it's still pretty big. Um, it feels huge. It just feels gigantic. So I would do trips up there. And um, I think I had an experience at one point where I took students stargazing and that felt really cool. So I decided to do that trip during the winter, which was ill-advised. And I decided to do it without tents, which was also ill-advised so that the kids could look up at the stars and have sort of a, kumbaya moment and like they'd be like eric you changed my life and then like <laughs> become like really wealthy hedge fund managers and send me money i don't know what my plan was but it was like a storm came in and it was freezing and you know the desert which is hot during the day obviously gets cold at night and we were at eleven thousand feet so it was really brutally cold um and that was that's an actual statement that i made to um, a co-instructor because we had also invited one of uh, a dad who really wanted to come with his daughter on this trip i was leading I mean, he wasn't quite ready for it. And he wore like a Marlon Brando leather jacket. And he like had this backpack that looked like he was being attacked from behind by a garbage heap. Like he must have been carrying 160 pounds of gear. And I thought he was going to have, I literally thought he was going to have a heart attack. So I had him stop and I had to like go up to the top of the trail and go back and get his, it was just, it was a disaster. Luckily everybody turned out okay. But that's the line that I said to my co-instructor as the wind was like whipping and kids were crying and he was down there, I was hypoxic and I was worried having a heart attack. I turned him and I said, I, I probably should have brought a tent. It's what I've said. That's all I could think of to say. Oh, and I, I, I spilled fuel that night and inhaled camping <laughs> fuel. So I literally like was like nauseous and like, I couldn't sleep. It was, and kids paid for that. <laughs> Crazy as that. It's like, a, it's like an employment strategy. So that's where the, that's where the quote came from. And, um, yeah. yeah, of course. Anything else out there? Yes. What was the best experience you ever had out there? Define best. What do you mean? Like most memorable or the happiest or happiest? Huh. In I'm counterpoint to all of these disasters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, um, um, I don't mean to sort of put the spotlight on, but my son is here tonight, Finn. And Finn um, and I took a an Adirondack trip, uh, hike trip which, is in the, which is in the book, um, last summer. And so we did our first like backpacking trip. And just the whole thing I thought was really, was incredible, like to be out there and to, um, um, you know, my dad took me on a lot of outdoor adventures or some of that in this book too. And so to sort of, in a multi-generational way, visit that suffering on my son that I experienced was really <laughs> rewarding. And I really enjoyed sort of passing that along um, to him as he grew up. So, but Again, those are the moments that I love more than anything um, um, is to be out there and, and just have that because you remember it, right? There's so much about, I think there's so much about our lives that goes by so fast and we don't remember it and we get home from work at the end of the week and we're like, what even happened? And it's very hard to sort of hang on to that stuff. But I will never forget being on Telescope Peak and forgetting a tent. Um, I'll never forget being with Finn, my son, and, and hiking in the outer Adirondacks. Those things just stay with me. So those are some of the ones that I definitely remember. Excellent. Well, I wanted to um, I wanted to thank um, Megan, Jared, and Ruby for having me. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here, and I'm so uh, flattered to be here at the Howe Library. Um, and uh, I'm grateful for you guys all showing up, and everybody in Zoom land for showing up as well. So thank you all so much. Thank um, you. And have a great evening. Thank you.